Welcome to episode 75 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent writing crime fiction inspired by true crime FBI cases. We get to speak to retired agent and former FBI profiler, Dr. Mary Ellen O'Toole, PhD, who served in the FBI for nearly 28 years. For more than half of that time, Mary Ellen O'Toole worked in the Bureau's prestigious Behavioral Analysis Unit, the BAU, where she consulted on many of the FBI's highest profile and most complex cases, including homicides, kidnappings, sexual assaults, predatory behavior, child molestation, and other crimes of violence. Dr. Mary Ellen O'Toole is recognized as the FBI's leading expert in psychopathy. In this episode, she talks about serial killers, sexual sadists, and reviews the case of Green River killer Gary Ridgway, who was convicted of killing 49 women. Post-retirement, Mary Ellen O'Toole is an internationally recognized forensic behavioral consultant and lecturer. She makes frequent media appearances on major TV and radio affiliates and has been interviewed in prominent newspapers and publications from around the country. In 2015, Dr. Mary Ellen O'Toole was appointed director of the Forensic Science Program at George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia. Her book, Dangerous Instincts, How Gut Feelings Betray Us, discusses the right way to assess people for everyday situations in our personal and professional lives and how to make safer decisions about them and the situations they create for us. You can learn more about Dr. Mary Ellen O'Toole by visiting her website, maryellenotoole.com. This was an absolutely fascinating interview, and I actually moved it up on the schedule because I wanted to dedicate it to all of the authors and readers who attended Thriller Fest with me this past weekend. For those of you who don't know what Thriller Fest is, it is the world's largest conference for authors and fans of thrillers, crime fiction, mystery, suspense novels. But because I just saw these two best selling authors this weekend, I want to specifically dedicate this episode to Lisa Gardner, who has a long standing best selling FBI profiler series, and to Stephen James, whose FBI special agent character, Patrick Bauer, is always matching wits with violent serial killers. I'll be sharing more information about Thriller Fest in my email to my FBI Retired Case File Review reader team that's going to go out during the first week of August. If you want to join my reader team, all you need to do is go to my website, jerrywilliams.com and sign up when you see the pop up. I also want to give you a heads up that I'm going to follow this episode with another episode next week on serial killers. I'll be speaking with retired agent Dr. Jerry Clark, who we spoke with in episode 13. He has a new book about female serial killers and his subject, Marjorie Dell Armstrong. One more thing before we begin the interview, I just want to say thank you to listeners who have gone out and purchased a copy of Pay to Play, my FBI crime thriller about a female FBI agent investigating corruption in the Philadelphia strip club industry. When you pick up a copy of Pay to Play for yourself or as a gift for someone you know loves crime fiction, you're helping to defray the cost for me to continue to produce ad-free content on a weekly basis. Plus, as you can tell from the reviews listed for Pay to Play on Amazon, it's a great read. So thank you. Now here's the show. I am excited to introduce my guest, Dr. Mary Ellen O'Toole. 
How are you today? I'm fine. Thank you. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Should I call you Dr. O'Toole or Mary Ellen? Oh, Mary Ellen. Thank you. We are colleagues. We never had a chance to meet during our careers, but um, as another uh, guest of mine said, it's all an FBI family. Isn't that true? We are family. And um, there were days, though, in the when we were working, didn't we say, yeah, this isn't a very nice family. But um, at the when it's all said and done, you do feel very connected to your to your retired colleagues. Absolutely. And that's exactly why I reached out to you, because I did an interview with Phil Sinna, who was in my FBI Academy training class, oh, so many years ago. And one of the things he said when I was interviewing him about his top 10 fugitive case was he, he brought you up and he said that Mary Ellen O'Toole was one of the best FBI profilers he had ever met. So kind of Phil to say that. I really appreciate that. You know, that was just, that's just so kind of him. I thought to myself, oh, I have to reach out and interview you. And, and I'm so glad that you agreed to be part of this FBI Retired Case File Review Project. There are two things I want to talk about today. Not just the role of the profiler, because I think most people who hear about FBI profilers, they think about you creating a profile for a subject, somebody that we're trying to find and somebody that we're trying to you know, figure out the, their mindset. But what Phil was telling me is that you also did work with witnesses, how to ask a question, how to formulate your interview in order to be the most successful. And I find that absolutely fascinating. So we want to talk about that. And then I have to talk to you about your book, which is called Dangerous Instincts, How Gut Feelings Betray Us, How Fear Can't Help You, An FBI Profiler Shows You What Can. That blows me away because we always hear about trust your gut. Tell us a little bit first about the FBI profiler. Who's in that unit at the Behavioral Analysis Unit? and why you decided to get into that. Just tell us everything you know. <laughs> sure, everything I know. Okay, <laughs> let me give it my best shot. The BAU, Behavioral Analysis Unit, as it's portrayed on Criminal Minds or other programs, is not the real world. So that shouldn't come as a shock to anyone. The BAU is a specialized unit, and it's um, all the profilers are located in one office space back at the FBI Academy, and we're all FBI agents. And that's probably the first thing that people don't understand. Um, they think we're, we're profilers, and with without any kind of you know kind of a definition behind it, but every profiler was an agent, went through the training academy as, as you and I did, and then went to the field and worked in the field somewhere between 10 to 15 years, um, getting a lot of investigative experience, um, going to crime scenes, testifying, interviewing people, doing surveillances, and then uh, we were eligible to apply to um, come back to the BAU, and when I applied to do that, there was quite a bit of competition because it is a unit that many people are, many agents are interested in um, and coming to. So you submit, just like you would in any you know, company, you submit an application and it gets reviewed and then they pick the people that had the best investigative backgrounds, experiences, and so forth. So um, once you're back at the BAU, then you're also given a lot of extensive ongoing training. In fact, I think right now the training lasts uh, for two, maybe two and a half years before you're actually really assigned cases. And the kinds of cases that we worked when I was in the BAU really ran the, the gamut from, say, child abduction to serial murder case. And now it's my understanding that there are a lot more um, specialized in terms of the work, but for me, being able to work all kinds of violence was really important because you don't have, you can't compartmentalize violence. Like there's the violence attached to kidnapping, then there's a violence attached to arson, there's a violence attached to homicide. I mean, violence has to be viewed along a continuum. So 
in the BAU, which is a very small unit. When I was there, I was I worked a, a number of different violent crimes, and then towards the end, worked primarily in in the serial murder uh, part of the BAU, and that's primarily what we did was was serial murder. But there is some misunderstanding about what the what the work of a FBI profiler is, and many hours a week you're sitting at your desk going through files and you're understanding crime scenes and you're understanding offender behavior. Um, people think that on a regular basis we do what is commonly referred to as a profile. And a profile is actually an assessment of an unsolved crime scene. If the person responsible for the scene is known, you don't profile a person. You do an assessment on that person. So there's a huge difference. A profile is a much broader look at the scene, and then from the scene you extrapolate the kind of personality of the offender. If you already know or have um, or believe you have a, a specific suspect, a specific human being in mind, and the law enforcement agency you're working with wants to conduct an interview with that person, then what we do are indirect assessments of that particular person, which means an assessment of who they are, what they're like, what their background is, they have any mental health issues, medical issues, to prepare the investigator or the FBI agent to walk into an inter interview room and do the very best job that they can. And we, we also use the indirect assessment to help um, prosecutors prepare to cross-examine a suspect if they take the stand in their own defense. So. Um, I think those are the two primary things that a profiler does, and they're very, very different from one another. Was there one that you enjoyed doing more than the other? No, I enjoyed doing both of them because they're both um, very challenging in their own way. One is not easier. You might think if I know that you committed this crime, it would be easier for me to come up with ideas on how to interview you or how to suggest you be interviewed, but it's, it's, it really isn't. I mean, you really have to pull together a lot of information about that person and then assimilate it all together and then put it in the context of um, a law enforcement interview. And you have to factor in things like, you know, how does this person act under stress? Um, What's important in this person's life? What's not important? Um, have they ever had contact with law enforcement before? What's their temperament like? If they have a, a, a diagnosable mental illness or have they ever been assessed with a personality disorder? And you may come up with as many as 50 factors that you know about the person and you have to take all of those 50, 60, 70 factors into consideration to offer a really good, reliable interview strategy. So that's very challenging. And then if you're looking at a series of unsolved crime scenes and you're, you look at scene after scene after scene, then it's, um, again, you have to take into consideration the forensics that were obtained from the scene. What do they tell you? Um, what was the offender's behavior with, with the victim, which we often get from, if it's a homicide, we, we glean a lot of information from the medical examiner's report, um, the injury pattern to the victim, who the victim was, what didn't happen at the crime scene. Everything that is part of that crime scene then has to be factored into and, and, and really condensed into what does this say about the unknown offender and, and who this person is in everyday life and what should investigators be looking for. Is that type of information gathered from the analysis of past cases or is that fresh every time you do it? It's, it's fresh. It has to be fresh every time you do it. But let's say I've looked at you know, hundreds of serial murder cases. So every, every serial murder, it, it, every crime is going to be different in very um, significant ways and maybe in very nuanced ways. But if I also know that once I've looked at this series of homicides and you know, I know that, um, let's say, the wound pattern of the victim and the medical examiner's report indicate that this is someone who was tortured prior to death and over an extended period of time, 
um, it may begin to suggest that the offender could be sexually sadistic. And then we know from other cases and research what that implies when I'm talking about someone who is a sexual sadist. So, yes, you have to look at the current case, but then you rely on your knowledge of other cases to expand that. You know, I think that a lot of us, you know, when we're looking at our, we're thinking about serial killers, especially when it comes to serial killers who kill women or children, we think of them all as sexual sadists. Uh, so it's kind of hard for me to distinguish, you know, the, the difference in, in, in what you're saying. It is, but for example, I've had cases where the fact pattern is very consistent with a sexual sadist who who wants a, a victim to be alive so that they can, they're sexually aroused by the victim's response to the infliction of physical or emotional pain. So that's a very different personality type in in many respects than the person that goes in and kills the victim very quickly because they want to engage in necrophilia. In other words, sex with a dead person. So I know it's very graphic, but it does suggest a very different type of offender, and therefore it suggests that you want to, once you learn their identity, you want to approach them differently in the interview. And how would you do that? What What are the different approaches? This is fascinating to me, you know. <laughs> what are the different approaches from somebody who gets their pleasure from seeing the victim in pain and somebody who just wants to kill them to what's the difference in the approach well at, without knowing let's say without knowing more of, uh, specifically about both offenders once we identified one is let's say John Joseph and the other person is is Tom Smith a sexual sadist um, they tend to be uh, pretty confident individuals. They tend to have a little bit more self-assurance than, say, someone that kills a person very quickly and then engages in necrophilia. Now, the underlying personality disorder that they tend to both share is known as psychopathy. Some people use the term sociopath, but that's a very outdated term. But both offenders may use um, both both offenders would likely manifest the 20 traits of psychopathy. So that would sort of tie them together. But you're a person that engages in, in, in necrophilia. They don't want to interact with a living victim. They, um, they want the person obviously to be, to be dead. So when you're looking at how they live their life when they're not committing those kinds of crimes, they're not as, um, really they're, they're not as organized. They're not as, as, self-assured as the person that's got, you know, good interpersonal skills like you would you tend to see with a sexual sadist. It's fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. So basically, just trying to give uh, listeners an understanding. So you would have cases throughout the, the country from FBI offices and also from law enforcement agencies, police departments uh, around the country uh, coming into uh, you, you know, to the unit and asking for these type of assessments. Right. Our cases come from a law enforcement organization agency like the Springfield, Illinois Police Department or the Philadelphia Police Department or or the San Francisco District Attorney's Office or they come in from um, an FBI field office. But it's always it's always law enforcement or the prosecution side of the criminal justice system. We do not take cases from defense attorneys or from private investigators. Okay. And so you, you, what kind of information do you have to start out with? I take it it is the responsibility, the responsibility of that agency to provide you as much information as they have. What, uh, what are you looking to receive before you start on your assessment? We are looking to receive everything that they have on their case. So we basically tell them, and usually it begins with a phone conversation, which I've had phone conversations with um, an agency or with another FBI field office that, is, that have gone on for hours. And the request, they just want to explain their case and explain what they've done. And that's part of um, your job as a, 
of the profiler is, is to be a good listener. So, but in the, at the end of that conversation, what I tell them is, I need everything that you have on this case. So Xerox the entire file for me. That's a perfect world if I can get that, and I can get that in an organized fashion. But here's the imperfect world, which we had to deal with a lot. You get that phone call, you know, at 9 o'clock at night, and you're ready to walk out of the field office or the FBI academy, and the call says, this just happened. Um, we, we think we got the guy, or we just found this body, and can you... You know, tell us what your, tell us what you think. Tell us what your opinion is. You know, how do we, what do we look for? How do we interview this person? What do you think that they've done with the victim? Now, you can't sit back and say, well, send me your whole file and I'll get to that on Monday. That's when you're on the phone and you're, you're getting your information verbally. You're getting everything from maybe two or three, maybe a conference call with ten people on the phone. And that's difficult. Oh, I could imagine so because you're also feeling that pressure, that that time constraint of trying to capture somebody before they victimize someone else, or if it's a situation where you know a victim has been kidnapped or, or abducted, then you're trying to get this assessment done, this analysis done, in order to 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 save them. Right, and and you go with what you know, and that's when that that's when that experience as an investigator becomes so valuable. Um, because you're tying that in with having that experience on the street yourself with the training and knowledge that you have as a profiler. But, yes, that's when you, um, you've you got to land on your feet. You don't have time to say, well, let me look up the research or let me, let me pull out a whole bunch of other similar kinds of cases and I'll get back to you. Oh, no, no, no. You wouldn't last in the BAU if you did that. Wow. <laughs> it sounds like a lot of... Uh... Uh, a pressure, a, 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 you know, a definitely high pressure uh, situation. It it really was, it really was, and I, I don't know that that sense is really portrayed um, in the TV shows or in the movies because you have a tremendous amount of responsibility that you're dealing with, and failure is not an option. Well, let me ask you if we could just backtrack for a second because you know one of the things that you said is. Very intriguing, and that's how important investigative skills are in doing this job. So if you could tell us a little bit about when you joined the FBI and what some of your initial assignments were, um, you know, what motivated you then to step away from the active case agent investigations to becoming a profiler? Sure. Well, I joined um, the FBI in... I did all the paperwork and so forth in um, 1980 and then was supposed to start in January of 1981 and President Reagan um, was inaugurated and he froze all the the new federal hires. But I started in April of 1981 um, and went through the FBI Academy and then was my first office was San Francisco FBI and I was assigned to the violent crime squad in San Francisco. And with that squad, we were tasked with a wide range of, of crimes from bank robberies to um, kidnappings. Uh, we also um, assisted um, local law enforcement up and down the California coast. We did extortions. We did bombing. So we really kind of ran the gamut of every violent crime that they have been. FBI is responsible for. And I think in part, the reason that I was assigned the Violent Crime Squad, because back then, and probably now, um, a lot of new agents want to be assigned that kind of investigation. I had spent four and a half years as a senior investigator with the San Francisco District Attorney's Office, so I'd already had that kind of experience therefore coming into the FBI and, and jumping into violent crimes was not a, a, a real big change for me. It was something that I, I was able to do um, and, and learn pretty quickly. Um, but my interest in the profiling had really pre, pre-existed my, my FBI career. I mean, I can remember scaring the heck out of my mother at the age of five or six, telling her that 
I really, I really wanted to know what went on in the head of people that killed other people. Oh and my I'm goodness. sure she, I know, I'm sure she <laughs> wanted to think about putting a lock on her bedroom door, thinking that, what the hell is this? Uh, but I've always had that in my mind, and I remember that before I ever started. Really, I mean, it's way back as five or six. It's just an interest I have. Now, if you ask me why, I cannot tell you why. Um, and that that interest in what goes on in people's heads when they commit violent crime has never waned at all. It never, I don't think it ever will. Um, but I should probably also tell you my mother worked for J. Edgar Hoover and my father was an FBI agent for about 10 years. Okay, so it's the family business. In a yes, way. in a way, but um, my parents were divorced, so I was never around my father, and my mother died before I got out of graduate school, so she she talked about it in a way that was, you know, from her experience, it was wonderful, but um, it has to be, it, it has to somewhat be in, in the DNA a little bit, because I don't think I did have a lot of parental influence. It was just something that I was drawn to. So, um, and then drawn to the whole idea of, you know, people who commit violent crimes and crimes of any kind and, and what is that like. So, and I had a master's in mental health counseling. So I had okay. done a lot of interviews with people that, you know, had, you know, life crises and things like that. In fact, there were times out in San Francisco when there would be a little bit of a, unique person, let's say, that would walk into the field office. Remember when we took, we would take walk-ins yes. and the <laughs> duty agent would be the one. And I always enjoyed that. And I still remember people saying, go get Mary Ellen, she'll do it. It's sort of like that commercial. Get Mikey. <laughs> he eats anything. She'll talk to anybody. <laughs> but I, I guess it. because, yeah, you, you liked seeing people and trying to figure them out. So I guess when somebody came in that anybody else would think was weird or strange, you would think them, you know, somewhat fascinating. Oh, yes. Let me talk to them. Let me sit down and hear what their story is and, and how did they get to be here today. So that that interest really just really, I think, motivated, fueled me to um, let the Bureau know that I was really interested in the profiling program and, and um and then in about 1985, um, I was transferred back to San Francisco from Phoenix. I did that San Francisco, Phoenix, San Francisco transfer. Um, and then I was assigned uh, really full time in San Francisco to to do the profiling there and to do police training. So okay. I really got I a was, lot of great experience. Yeah, I was wondering about that. So that when you first got to San Francisco, that was one of those six month things. Pretty much it was, yeah, they swore I could be there for my entire career. And I was, I, I, I thought to myself, okay, I'll, I'll I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> Within a year I was transferred. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cause you normally, and, and we've talked about this on, on the podcast before. Um, I don't know what's happening now, but definitely during the time we came in, because I came in in, in 1982, you know, you might have gone back to your, original office for you know six months to a year but then you were shipped out i actually was shipped out to sacramento um so i was i worked in sacramento for a number of years before being assigned to philadelphia so i was wondering how you got to san francisco but you were in phoenix for how long well, first I went to San Francisco, which was the office that processed me, and that was the transfer policy at the time. You go back, if you came from a major field office, you went back to the major field office. But then they changed it when, within about a year of being an agent, then they changed it. And it was, remember when they had 10169? Yes, and I remember And they were transferring that. those people? That's a, 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 a man, an agent from Phoenix was 10169. He got transferred to San Francisco, and they transferred me to his position in Phoenix. And I worked in Phoenix for a little over a year, and then we all had to put in for the field office that we wanted to go to, and I put in for Chicago because I'm from Illinois anyway. So I put in for Chicago, and I, when I got my transfer orders for my, that would have been my third office, it said back to San Francisco. And you said, so I did the happy dance. I did. I did the happy dance. Because I was married and my husband and I were commuting back and forth from Phoenix. So 
Oh, well, that was that was perfect. Let me just explain for the listeners. Ten one sixty nine refers to at that time any agent who had joined the FBI after October first, nineteen sixty nine, who had not been transferred to a large office was all of a sudden told that they would have to go to a major field office. So somebody who had may have been in Norfolk, uh, in Virginia, for, you know, 10, 15 years, all of a sudden were told, oh, you didn't do any of your major field office time, and so now you're going to Philadelphia. It was uh, <laughs> it was a, uh, a hard time for many agents who had settled into their smaller, medium-sized office. Oh, it sure was. Wow. All right. Thank you so much for explaining that time, your early time in the uh, in the Bureau for us, because I, I do think it really gives people a really good understanding of what it takes and what the unit is looking for for, for profilers. But I, I do want to go back uh, to, to, to the unit, and maybe if you could give us some examples of some of the major cases that you were able to... Uh, contribute to? Sure, sure. One case that I, I worked was the Green River serial murder case out in Seattle, Washington. And oh, yeah. it, Gary Ridgway ends up being the Green River killer, but before he, his identity was known, he had murdered women in starting in the late 60s during the 1970s, during the 1980s, during the 1990s, and then early 2000s. In, um, and it was all, it was all up in the Northwest. At least most of his murders were up in the Northwest. Um, in 1987, Gary was, because he was known to frequent the area of Seattle where many of these women work, they were primarily, you know, prostitutes who worked on the street. Because he was known to law enforcement, they brought him in for a polygraph exam in 1987 and he was um he didn't pass or he didn't fail it um and they're still reviewing those polygraph records to this day um but what the detective did at the time and and he would tell you if he were sitting right here he'd say Mariella, i don't even know why i did it because dna really didn't exist but he took a buccal swab from inside of gary's mouth in, in other words he put a q-tip in there and removed some of the cells and he stored it correctly back in 1987. And then um, the case continued and continued, no suspect, no suspect. And in 2001, Tom Jensen took that piece of evidence and sent it to the Washington State Lab. And Fourteen years they, later. Yeah, can you believe that? And they came back and they wow. said, we, we know who the Green River is. <laughs> and he said, don't tell me it's Gary Ridgway. And they said, yes, it's Gary Ridgway. And and the case really got um, kind of got lost because the arrest was made right around um, 9/11, and so obviously 9/11 had just took over at that point with um, our attention and everybody's attention. But at, in the next part of that year, the prosecutor called and asked me if I testify regarding the behavior of the five. Uh, bodies that were found in the Green River. That's why he was called the Green River Killer. The first five bodies were found in the Green River, and they, and they were recovered, and they had uh, forensic evidence um, from the bodies, but they needed to link them. And so I was preparing for testimony, and then they called and they said, we're working out a plea agreement with Mr. Ridgway, and if he takes us to the bodies, then we're taking the death penalty off of the table. And I said, okay, so good luck with that. Within two weeks, they had called back and said, what is up with this guy? He's making us nuts. And I said, well, what's going on? And they said, we're interviewing him, and one day he'll tell us the sky is blue, and then the next day, next day there's no sky, and then the next day the sky is not blue. And I said, well, that's because he probably has traits of psychopathy, which makes him a habitual or pathological liar. And then I explained the whole issue of psychopathy. These are people without a conscience. They're not mentally ill, but they don't have a conscience. So um, I, they asked me to come out there. So over the course of about six months, I went back and forth um, three or four times for two, three weeks at a time to help them interview Gary Ridgway. And during that time, 
Um, he took um, investigators to the bodies. And what's so interesting about this is that they went to the families of these women, and these women had families that loved them dearly, and they were daughters, they were mothers, they were aunts, and they said to them, look, you, your loved one is still missing. Now, if you want, we can prosecute this individual on five cases only, and if we win, he'll, he'll be given a death penalty. However, we are prepared, this is the prosecutor speaking, we are prepared to take the death penalty off the table if you, the family, tell us that you want us to find your loved one. So it's, you tell us what you want. And I, you know, and now I see prosecutors doing that more and more. And the, the family of loved ones whose bodies had never been found, who had been missing for uh, two and three decades, they said, you know, Mr. Prosecutor, uh, please take the death penalty off the table, which means he would have been, he was given life. We want him to take investigators to, to the bodies. And so that happened over a course of six months. He literally was able to take investigators to the locations where he left the remains of, ultimately, it was 49 women. Um, 49 that to women. In one it's county. Was, so that's just in, in the Seattle area. So we're not even yeah. talking about the other killings that you no. told us about that he did. Oh, my goodness. Is he's he one of the most prolific him. serial killers he's, that we know? Yes, he's considered probably the most prolific serial sexual killer in the United States. There are other people that are, you know, that are up there, but as far as the yes. serial sexual killer, yes. And certainly he's traveled to um, Southern California. He's traveled to Portland. One time, um, several years back, he was calling me at home and we were talking and he wanted to, um, my neighbors were over there at my house and I answered the phone and they said, who's on the phone? And I go, Gary Ridgway, you know, the Green River Killer. I was going to say, early. he's calling you at home. <laughs> he did. Um, I had a throwaway phone that I got so because I, I knew he wanted to maybe talk a little bit more about his murders. My neighbors put down their wine glasses, got up, and left my house. They just left my house. And I said, you guys, he's he's way out in Seattle. It's not like he's down the street. But he's been, he talked about driving all over the country on vacations with his family and so forth. So the potential for more victims is, is real. Um, but unfortunately, you know, the age of the case means that if bodies are found, um, there will likely be no forensic evidence that can be recovered or it's going to be minimal. So, yeah, it's just a tragic case. And, and really, he's just done generational damage to to so many families with his behavior. But if sitting down and talking to him, you would never, ever know that who he was or what wow. he was responsible for. He was not ashamed of it. He was very proud that he had gotten away with it for all those years. And he just, he referred to himself as a lean, mean killing machine. And he was very wow. proud to be the Green River Killer. Well, that's going to lead us into to your book about, you know, your gut. But before we get there, mm-hmm. I do just want to, you know, you talked about helping these investigators interview him. And then, you know, you talk about you've actually spoken to him yourself. So I was assuming uh, initially that they would come out of the room and say, what should we ask him next? Or he answered this way. What should we do to get him to, you know, to, to open up more? But it sounds like it was much more participatory. You, you actively talked to him. So tell us, you know, in, in that, that situation and other situations, how you helped with those interview uh, situations. Sure. Um, yeah, no, I would go in and I, I would, would talk to Gary um, four hours at a time, and then I would come out, and then um, another member of the interview team would go in. They divided the interview up into sections almost, so the investigators who had been on the case for many years, they knew the details of all the missing women, and so they were responsible for interviewing him about the specific crime scenes, and primarily my responsibility was to get him to talk about his practice murders. And practice murders are the murders that a serial killer will commit when he's learning 
how to become a serial killer, like how does he like to kill? What's the kind of weapon that he likes? Um, what kind of victim does he choose? How should he dress? Um, what time of day should he do it? So those are known as practice murders when he's making mistakes but learning as he goes. And so that's what I was attempting to um, to, to talk to him about. Absolutely fascinating. All right, now let's talk a little bit about about your book and the and the and the project and the research you did on that because I'm thinking that for these 49 women and and plus that we don't know about that when they encountered him that they had gut feelings. I've heard other people say, other profilers say, you know, to trust your gut and and when the hair goes back on, you know, up on the back of your neck, you know, to to trust your gut and, and take action. And your research and, and your thoughts are that your gut feelings can portray, uh, that gut feelings can portray us. So I can't wait to hear what you have to say on this issue. Well, what I have to say is, is this, and you are absolutely, absolutely correct. In so many of the cases, and I'm sure in, the, in, in your cases, the victim didn't see it coming, didn't, didn't, experience that um, tumultuous um, burn or sense of queasiness in the stomach. And, and a, part, a good part of the reason is that oftentimes what we use to gauge someone's dangerousness are things like this. If they're married, it can't be that bad. If they have a nice house, hey, they got a nice house. If they have the same religion that we have, if their child goes to the same school, um, if they have kind of the same um, uh, background, if they are our next door neighbors, I mean, we do they dress well? We use those as as the trappings to tell us whether or not someone is safe or someone at least that they're not going to hurt us. And those have nothing to do with whether or not someone could be dangerous. So in the case of Gary Ridgway, when he was um, driving around Seattle and he was approaching some of these women, keep in mind that these were very savvy women and they learned how to be safe out in the street and they learned how to interact with a lot of different people. But up comes Gary and they were, he was known to them. He would come up and he would, in some cases, he would have his child's toys um, on the floor. They would walk over to the car and they would literally say to him, as he reports it, you're not that serial killer everybody is looking for. And he'd say, how can I be that serial killer? I've got a kid. I've got a child. His toys are on the floor of my car. And so we asked him, um, well, when you got to the point, did you ever take your little boy with you? when you would pick up women? And he said yes. There were times when wow. he had his little boy in the back seat. And he was asked, what would you do if he woke up? He was, And he was verbal. The little boy was verbal. What would you have done if he woke up and saw you strangling someone? And his comment was, I would have just killed him. So, but he had the trappings of normalcy is what I call it. And the trappings of normalcy are things that we believe are indicators whether or not somebody is safe or they're not safe. Now, I will agree, though, with you on, on this one indicator. If, if, for example, and I use this in my classes, if you are standing next to someone and for whatever reason or they are interacting with you and, and really you are completely creeped out by him or her and that proverbial hair in the back of your neck goes goes up, get out of there. It's it, There's no reason to test this theory. <laughs> go, get out of there, right? Because the only way to test it is to not get out of there and see what happens. I do believe that there are circumstances where we've all had that visceral visceral reaction to someone. And I, at that point, yes, I'd say just leave whatever it is that you're doing. But unfortunately, most of the time when we're around someone um, that we're checking out that we don't know well, we don't have that sense. And people think that there's an internal barometer that we're all born with, and it's called this the kind of the instinct in your gut, and we all have it, and everyone's is equal, and it's not affected by medicine or alcohol or illness. That's that's fairy tale thinking, because um, a lot of people who are I come from the Midwest, our upbringing um, causes us, I think, not causes us, but influences how we view people. If you're the prior victim 
of a crime, um, your how you view a new person in your life is really going to be affected by your prior experience of being a victim. If you take medication, and we, you and I know this from going into interviews with people, maybe we had cold medicine, or um, you're you're not on your game, you're not sharp the way you should be. So there's so many things can impact your um, your ability to read people the right way that are just external. They don't ha- even have anything to do with whether or not you're a good observer of behavior. So to think that we have this magical system that we're equally born with, it, again, it's magical. And there's no place, no, I'm now at um, George Mason University in Fairfax. We don't offer any courses on how to improve your gut instinct or how do I get a good instinct like she's got because hers is better than mine or how do I jumpstart my, my gut instinct? It's, it, it really is, it's amazing to me how many people believe. It's like believing, um, you know, in, in fairy tales, um, unicorns to believe that you're born with this inner barometer system and to trust wow. it, something that doesn't exist. You know, so like the light bulb just went off. I, I, I get it. What you're saying when how your gut feeling can betray us is that you're expecting the gut to kick in when you're in danger, and sometimes that that are many times that won't happen. And so, just because your gut isn't telling you get out of there, doesn't mean that you should be looking around and assessing the situation at a more intelligent level. And exactly right. And if we all had such finely tuned gut instincts, we would not have millions and millions of people, both men and women, living in abusive relationships today, just in the United States. These are not women and men who went out looking for the most abusive person they could find to partner up with. They misread the indicators. They misread them. So if when you look at it that way, I think it begins to make a lot more sense. We misread people, I think, more than we read them correctly. And people who want to be misread, they want to come across as, oh, you can trust me. I'm not going to hurt you. Oh, sure. Yeah, no, I'd love to date you. You're like perfect for me. And and then we don't really vet them. And yet when our friends tell us, our family tells us, that, that guy, that gal is a creep, we're now so invested in them that we can't break away. It's pretty frightening how poor readers of others that we ultimately really are. Yeah. I mean, this, I mean, for, for me, um, even as, you know, a, a retired FBI agent, this is just absolutely enlightening because, you know, we always go around assuming that you know, we're going to, our gut is going to tell us when we're in danger. And I, I do think I have, I may be a lucky one that does have uh, those, that situation where I can kind of look and, 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 and I, I think you need that in law enforcement. But that doesn't necessarily mean it was correct. I acted, you know, and, and stepped away from a situation because my gut reacted. doesn't mean it was correct. I might have been in, you know, a safe situation. But it's fascinating to to realize that you can't depend on your your gut. Um, and and I'd love for you to talk just a little bit more about how these you know I I know you used another word than psychopath, but how they know exactly how to manipulate our feelings and make people feel that they're they're safe when they're not. It's a pretty frightening phenomenon, but um, we estimate that about 10% of the, it's an estimate um, of the population, are people that would meet the definition of a psychopath. So I don't want your listeners to go out and say, oh my gosh, I dated a guy like that, or um, oh yeah, I think my ex-wife was a psychopath. Um, it really takes a lot of experience and training to assess someone at that as being um psychopathic, but a psychopathic individual is not mentally ill, that's number one, but they have 20 traits that are um, are, are universal. So if we're talking about a psychopath in, in Ireland or South America or in Europe, they would, for the most part, all have the same traits. So here's a few. They tend to be very glib and charming people. So when you meet them, 
they're outgoing, they're extroverts, they can talk about many things, however, nothing in real depth. Um, they're, they're just very charming. They, they kind of light up a room. Another trait is that they are pathological liars, and a pathological liar means that they lie about everything, even things that they don't need to lie about. They are uh, people without empathy for others. It doesn't mean that they have, they might, but um, it's very it's very difficult to go back and historically show this. But these are people profoundly lacking in empathy for others, profoundly lacking in empathy. These are people classically referred to as without a conscience. And we know from the brain scans that have been done, on individuals who've been assessed as psychopaths, their brains are different than a non-psychopath. These are people that are highly impulsive, extremely manipulative. They blame others for everything. They will not accept any responsibility for um, the consequences of their actions. These are our individuals who are um, always, they're very positive in their kind of outlook um, towards life. They think about the here and now. They don't worry about tomorrow. Those are just kind of a cluster of, of but the, the, the cluster of traits fall together. You can't cherry pick and say, well, I've got a psychopath who has these traits, but they don't have these traits. So when you meet someone who's extremely charming and very manipulative, they can be very, very disarming. And I've sat across the table from, as you have, a number of offenders, and I think to myself, would I have gotten in the car with you, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago? Because look at you, you sound good, you look good, um, and yet I know what you're capable of. So you have you have serial killers who are psychopathic, but you have white-collar individuals, people that run a company or, um, you know, have gone to college, and, and um, they can also be psychopathic. So... But these are are people that they have a, what we call a very predatory mindset. And so when you're around them, they read you better than you read them. I'm so glad that you brought up white collar because that's what I did my entire career. Advanced fee schemes, Ponzi schemes, business, business, telemarketing fraud. And there you go. One of the things, yeah, and one of the things about my subjects that I always loved is they always thought they were the smartest person in the room. And that's how, why I enjoyed doing that work. You know, just trying to figure out what they had to say to themselves every day that made them feel it was okay to steal some retired person's money. You know, what was in their mind that made them operate their business knowing they were cheating everybody in that business or embezzling money? and be able to go into work and smile every day. So (laughs) I guess it's that same type of personality. They just chose to use it uh, to get money uh, for greed as opposed to to kill people for sexual satisfaction. Well, and I'm sure you had some of those white-collar people that would have been – a psychopathic. I mean, it's it's a – you know, it's it's certainly not the majority of offenders whatsoever, but – I mean, these are people that could, you know, cheat an old couple out of their life savings and go home and and, and have a barbecue with their family and not think one iota about what they have just done and not care. I mean, they are they have no remorse for what they do. So when you're talking to them, whether a white collar person or a, a murderer, you can't talk to them about the victims. They're very arrogant. That's another trait, is that they are very arrogant. So you have to talk about them. Don't bother them about the victims. They don't want to talk about the victims. Talk about them. What a great white-collar um, guy that they are. What a great killer they are. They don't care about the victims, you know? Mm-hmm. And and that's kind of stunning when you you realize when you go into the interview, you just you just want to scream, but you compose yourself, right? And you go in and you focus on them because that's what they respond to. Wow. Well, I don't want to take too much of your time. This has been absolutely fascinating. I will say that, you know, I watch 2020, you know, every uh, every Friday night, and I was <laughs> I'm watching it knowing that we had this interview scheduled, and I see you come across the screen. So it sounds like you still do a lot of work in this area as far as commentary and presentations and speaking. Can you talk to us about uh, what you're doing now and what kind of, uh, you know, business you have now? Oh, sure. 
um, well, I have my own consulting business, but um, I actually went back to work full time. So currently, I'm the director of the forensic science program at George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia, and. I have wonderful faculty and wonderful students, all of whom want to be forensic scientists, so that is really um, my full-time job, although I still consult on cases and I still do um, the media um, like the 2020 or 48 hours when, I, when the time permits. So, um, But what's nice is now I can pick and choose because, as you know, working as an FBI agent, there was no outside employment. That was it. So now it's it's fun. I can sort of do what I want, but the downside of that is it's like being a kid in a candy store. I go back to the whole idea of being five years old. I can't get enough of trying to figure out what made this guy do it, and so I find myself working 24-7. <laughs> that's not good. <laughs> no, that that's not good. Well, what really, really means that I have to thank you for taking the time out to, to speak with me for, for this hour. I'm absolutely honored and amazed that I, you know, have retired agents who are willing to participate, you know, in FBI retired case file review, uh, and especially those who, who are considered experts in the FBI. So I want to thank you. So I want to give you the last word. Uh, you can either sum up your general FBI career, your career as a profiler, or give us some tips on going with their gut. I'd, I'd like to give you the, the last word. What would you like to say? Wow. Well, what I think I um, is really important, because now I, I teach young people who whose dreams are right in front of them and whose future has, has just, they have so many possibilities that if you know, a career in the FBI or an agency like the FBI, whether it's Secret Service, DEA, or a local law enforcement agency, if that is your inclination, if if that's your goal, if that's your dream, go for it. And just remember, though, when you're you're planning and prepping for these careers, when you're in grade school, because you have to have the the best ethics and 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 the you know a, a good background to be able to to go into one of these positions because there are strict rules and regulations about things like drugs and alcohol and that sort of thing um, but it is so worth it to be able to have a career like this where every day you get up and I have a feeling you were the same way you got up in the morning and you said I'm an FBI agent that is so cool and so Absolutely. I like to see my students have that dream and have that dream come true and it's possible and that's the end of the interview. As always, back at jerrywilliams.com, you'll find a photo of Dr. Mary Ellen O'Toole, and you'll find links to the FBI's website's eight-part series on serial killers, which also contains profiles of several well-known serial killers. There's also a link to Mary Ellen O'Toole's website and a really cool, fascinating blog post she wrote titled, Top 10 Reasons Not to Go With Your Gut. And I also have a link to where you can purchase Mary Ellen's book, Dangerous Instincts, How Gut Feelings Betray Us. If you enjoyed the interview, I hope you share it with your friends, family, and associates. I make it easy for you. On my website, at the bottom of this episode's show notes, you'll find all the social media share buttons. But if you're listening to this on your cell phone, you can also share it directly from your device. In keeping with my theme to dedicate this episode to Thriller Fest, my crime fiction recommendation is Accused by Lisa Scottolini. I had a chance to talk to Lisa on the phone when I was the spokesperson for the Philadelphia FBI office, and she even acknowledged me in one of her books, but Thriller Fest was the first time I had the opportunity to meet her in person. Accused is another book in Lisa Scottolini's series featuring her all-female law firm, Rosada and Associates. And in this book, Associate, now partner, Mary Denunzio, 
takes on a 13 year old genius client who is trying to find the real killer of her sister who had been murdered. I've already read a number of Lisa's books, and this one did not disappoint. It's a legal thriller with strong characters, especially Mary Denunzio's slightly kooky South Philly relatives. So again, my crime fiction recommendation for this episode is Accused by Lisa Scottolini. And while you're on Amazon picking up a copy of Accused, I hope you also will check out my FBI crime thriller, Pay to Play. And don't forget to go to my website and join my FBI Retired Case File Review reader team. When you join the team, I'll send you my FBI reading resource, a list of all the books, crime fiction, nonfiction, and memoirs written by the FBI agents who have been interviewed on this podcast, books about the FBI written by FBI agents. This episode was sponsored by FBIRetired.com, the only online directory made available to the general public featuring retired FBI agents and analysts interested in showcasing their skills to secure business opportunities. I want to thank you for listening, and I hope you come back again for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.